Wendy Williams is polarizing. Either you absolutely love her or you absolutely hate her. But either way, we're going to talk about her new documentary, Where is Wendy Williams from a licensed therapist perspective? Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hey. But if you're a returning subscriber, you already know how my videos go. Now, before I even get into any content, there are going to be spoiler alerts up in through this video. So if you have not watched the documentary, go ahead and click off, go watch it, and then come back and chat with me in the comment section because we got some stuff to talk about. So let's start the conversation now. Put in the comment section, what are your thoughts about the documentary and just about Wendy Williams in general? The first thing that we cannot ignore is the fact that every Everybody has been saying, karma, karma, karma. She's getting what she deserves. She built a whole career about talking about people and making fun of people and being in other people's business. And now she is in the spotlight and look how she expects everybody to be empathetic and loving and kind towards her when she hasn't been that way to anybody else. Now, I personally don't know Wendy Williams, but one thing that I do know is that you do reap what you sow. And if you are speaking negativity, if you are speaking words, if you are saying things that are inappropriate, if you have been talking about other people in other ways, God has a way of spinning the block on you and making sure that you eat your words. So I'm not a big fan of people saying that we shouldn't care. She did this to herself. Oh, well, get over it. I honestly think it's sad. I don't wish any of the things that we saw in this documentary on my worst enemy. And even if some of these issues were self-induced, meaning she calls them on herself, I do think that she's still human. She's still a mother she's still a daughter she's still a cousin she's still an auntie she's still a fill in the blank and we should have some level of empathy or at least sympathy for what she is experiencing now it's some of y'all that's still gonna be like nah i don't care nothing about that keandra she's getting what she deserved but to each its own it's up to you because if you were going through some of the things would you expect people to have empathy towards you think about it the second thing that we have to talk about is guardianship I had no clue that banks had this level of power and authority to control somebody's money if they are expecting or if they are seeing some type of red flags or some type of issues that can cause concern. They went all the way to the courts and said, look, there's some funny business happening in Wendy Williams' account. We're concerned. This is not like her normal spending. Something needs to be done about it. And guess what the New York courts did? <laughs> they issued a court order guardianship over her finances. So if you don't know what this means in the quick and dirty version, she has no access to any of her own funds or her own money. Now we know Wendy Williams was pretty successful. So we're probably talking about millions of dollars at this point. Can you imagine building a career up, having all of the coin to be able to support yourself and your family, and now you don't have access to it? That's scary. From what I understand, I think she probably gets like a certain amount of money or they pay all of her expenses, whether that is business or personal to make sure that things are still rolling, but she doesn't have access to the funds because they don't deem her appropriate or capable of managing her own funds due to her current state, whether that's a mental state or a physical state. Now on part two, because this was a two part documentary, there was a woman who said that there were so many, there was an expert who came on, I can't can't remember her name or the book that she was talking about but she talked about how there were so many different holes in the guardianship process and you would think that the courts would have someone's best interest in mind but in actuality the flip side is true and they just assign anybody to be over someone's estate she even said that there are so many times where she has seen thousands of cases where the court or the judge would choose to have a random guardian over someone's estate and finances versus their family member or a close friend who's also capable of doing so. And this is where it gets tricky because everybody was like, hold on, hold on. All of the family and the friends and the uncles and the daddies and the cousins and the aunts and the sisters and all of the nieces and the nephews that she has and even her son. How is it that 10, 20, 30, 40 people, none of them are capable of being her guardian? Something's fishy here. And to be honest, from what I've seen, her niece, Alex, was very well she got her ish together, her nephews, it seemed like her sister. There were so many different people in her life who seemed very capable of being able to take care of it because they didn't seem that they were really even caring about the money. They cared about her livelihood, her health, 
and her mental health more than anything else. I personally felt like whoever this guardian is, they obviously wasn't trying to be a part of this documentary. They didn't give um, any type of comments or commentary. They even like redacted her name when, they, when it was spoken or his name when it was spoken. So we don't know who this person is or what they're doing because the case is sealed. That means you can't even figure out the details of why this happened, how, what, when, and it's sealed. But it was like this guardian wasn't doing their job because if your job is to make sure that Wendy is protected, she's cared for, her resources are intact and everything else, why was it that she was alone so much of the time knowing that she has a problem with alcohol and knowing that she's not taking care of herself? Why doesn't she have an assistant coming and helping her? Why doesn't she have someone who is like a live-in nurse who can assist her? Why is her refrigerator empty and no Nobody's checking to make sure that she's eating. Why is she able to do all of these things and nobody is checking in on her like that? It's sad. It's really a sad situation. But one thing that I am excited about is all of this gets reevaluated every single year. While she had a guardian and a guardianship over the last year, this is still going to be reevaluated to see one, if she's capable of getting back on track to take care of her own finances in her own life, or two, assigning someone else in her family or her friends who is capable of being able to do so. So we'll see how this part plans out. But either way, she was like, Wells Fargo, <laughs> you better give me my money. You better give me my coin. The third thing that we absolutely have to talk about is there isn't a court, there isn't a judge, there isn't anybody legally who is going to take someone's authority and their freedom away if there isn't a just a cause and a reason to do so. And I firmly believe even though the court records are sealed that the judge saw that she wasn't able to take care of herself because of a number of things. One being the health issues. Now in part one of the documentary, we heard everything from thyroid issues, Graves disease, dementia. We heard all of these different like medical terms and diagnosis, but no one was just like on point with it, which also raises the question in regards to the guardianship. Why isn't your teams collaborating? Why isn't your doctor collaborating with the therapist, with the psychologist, with the rehabilitation, with why isn't everyone communicating to be able to give her the best overall holistic care? But then it wasn't until part two where her son says that she was given the diagnosis of alcohol-induced dementia. That's when it all made sense to me. But if you think about it, Wendy was starting to go downhill before this diagnosis. She went through so much. You can't even imagine how one's mental health is impacted when you experience a divorce and a very public divorce at that, you experienced the loss of your mother, whom she stated was like her best friend and they were very close and they had a great relationship. This was happening during the middle of the pandemic where everybody was already isolated and alone on top of any ongoing health concerns with her lymphedema and even alcoholism. So can you imagine all of these things happening in your life and you don't really know what to do about them or with them, so you go to what? the bottle. And we know that people who struggle with alcohol, they're basically trying to escape and numb the pain. They have experienced some type of trauma, some type of event, some type of things that have happened in their life that they're trying to cope with. And they're not necessarily coping with it in a positive light. They're coping with it in a negative way because they're trying to drink their problems away. And we all know what happens with that. You can numb your pain for a little while with the bottle and with the alcohol, but once that high, well, not the high, once the, the alcohol wears off and you're no longer intoxicated, all of your problems are still very present and right there. And you gotta deal with it. To be honest with you, I don't know if Wendy is ready to deal with it. It, it seems like she didn't wanna deal with the issues. It seems like she didn't want to feel, and it seems like she didn't and wasn't ready to heal either. Because there were so many times when the producers who were filming her had questions and she would be like, nope, I'm not answering that. Next question, please. Nope. Uh-uh. And it was like there was just some topics that she was just unwilling to address, period. And I believe that it was going to bubble up and really require her to reflect, to think, and to really take accountability for the things that she's done. 
or a lack thereof. Honey, let's talk about this on the fourth one. <laughs> we're going to lump the family, friends, and we're going to call them the co-workers into this as well. I can't even believe that her family felt isolated from her with her being in New York and most of them being in Florida. They weren't really seeing each other that much. The limited conversation and contact was happening. It really wasn't knowing and being updated by the Guardian on what's going on with her medical and her mental health stuff and her living situation it was kind of like they just had to find out information as they could and that's heartbreaking to know that her dad who is elderly right barely knows what's going on with his daughter and her brother whom she actually thought was kevin at one point in the did y'all see that in the last scene she was like kevin it's so nice to see you and i was just like Whoa, her dad's face after that broke my heart because it was truly an indicator to him that my daughter, her memory is gone. She can't even recognize people or remember who people are. And that was her biological brother. But I am thankful for their resiliency and the capacity and the desire to want to be in her life. Now, we know all the rumors that have been had and said about her son and her nephews being overindulgent with resources. Somebody said that his apartment was like 80K a month or something like that, and that he spent over $100,000 in a month on like Uber Eats and things of that nature. But according to him and his testimony, he said, every single thing that I have ever done, every single card that I have ever swiped has been because my mom has given me permission to do so. I think Wendy spent over 120K, I believe, on her son's birthday party. You know, like according to outside sources and maybe even the judge and other people, they may see that as excessive. But when you are a multi-millionaire and you've created a certain lifestyle and your child has been privy to a certain lifestyle, baby, they're used to spending tens of hundreds of thousand dollars on things that would seem excessive to the average person. And we also know that she overdid it financially and gave her son, her only son, whatever he wanted because she felt guilty about her drinking. She felt guilty about not being as present as she should have been. So yeah, he's probably used to spending large amounts of money that others may think is for stupid stuff. And from what I understand, that situation is one of the things that prompted the guardianship and for Wells Fargo to kind of like put up a little bit of a red flag to say something awkward and weird is going on with her finances and someone needs to take a deeper dive and deeper look into this. Now, one of the scenes that I absolutely love is the scene where Black China came or Angela, as she likes to be called these days, came and visited Wendy. That was such a beautiful, wholesome scene. I don't know what it was about that interaction, but I felt like they both needed it. She needed that hug <laughs> that Black China Angela gave her at the end. And also Angela needed the hug too, because she just kind of stayed and laid and hugged on her and gave her love. And she was one of the very few actually one of the only people or one of the only friends that we saw on the whole entire documentary. So I also thought that that was strange. I'm like, where's all her friends at? And why did they choose not to be a part of the documentary and show up and support her? She talked about so many times, I'm so lonely. I'm so bored. I don't have anything to do. And it's because she felt like nobody was present or physically there with her. She had to feel like the producers and the people who worked for her were her actual friends because it felt and filled that void that she had of the emptiness of her apartment when everybody was gone. It's a very warped thinking that the people who works for you or works with you on a particular project is your friends and you are yearning for their presence more than someone who's supposed to have been a really good friend to you in other areas and other parts of your life when things were going well. Because one of the things that bothered my whole entire soul <laughs> was this manager, Will, and that publisher, I think her name was Sean or something like, oh, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about Will. I, feel, I, I don't know him personally from what I understand. He is a jeweler instead of being like an actual manager. So I'm not sure how he had that managerial 
a position for Wendy. Um, uh, rumors have it that they used to sleep together before all of this went down when she was actually doing well. I mean, it's, it's tricky, right? We heard a lot from him. It seemed like he had a lot of control and not necessarily in a bad way, but he had a lot of say so in her life. He was the one who was giving a lot of commentary. Um, there was a lot of scenes with him, you know, in it. And I get that part, but there was just something off and a little fishy about that for me that I was like, mm, there's something, some piece to the puzzle that's missing here. Is it me or did y'all feel the same way? Because one thing that I was just like, is this girl delusional? Is this publicist? <laughs> I feel like she just ruined her whole career because she acted delusional. She acted blind. Like she could not see Wendy's decline. Like she couldn't see that Wendy couldn't remember things. Like she couldn't see that Wendy could barely walk and she's not eating and all of these different things. And you go up and take this girl all the way across the country to LA to have a meeting with NBC to get her back on TV. When you know doggone well, she's not in the best mental state to do so. That's manipulation. That's extortion. That's weird. And when she said, Wendy's on the up and up and I don't see anything wrong with her and she looks perfectly fine to me. I'm like, Girl, what? <laughs> so either you are trying to protect your job because you want that coin, or you are literally delusional and crazy. Cray. And we need to admit you to the psych ward. Her relationship was just so weird. Like Wendy was so rude and disrespectful to her at times. Wendy flat out told her to her face, girl, you need liposuction. Go and eat something in the kitchen that's gonna make you sad and gain even more weight. And she just took it. She didn't come back. She didn't correct it. She didn't say anything. It was just like, she just allowed Wendy to do and say anything that she wanted to. And I'm not sure why she was that passive. I understand people with dementia, you don't want to rock the boat, but there was just something off there. It was just like, you seem like you're really here just for a paycheck because you want Wendy to come back and be greater than ever so you can make more money being her publicist and you're not there because you really love her and care about her. You're there for other reasons and ulterior motives. And last but not least, we have to talk about Wendy's career because we would be lying if we said that she didn't have a quote unquote successful career before she even got on TV, before she even started doing the Wendy Williams show and how you doing all of that stuff before she became super big. She was also a very well known like radio personality. She was like killing it for years and years. And I'm not sure if she was doing like like celebrity gossip and all of that stuff on her show because obviously I didn't listen to it in the 90s. I was like a kid essentially, but she was very big. And so when she made that transition to the Wendy Williams show, she was at the height of her career. Everybody knew her, everybody loved her or hated her. For me, I've never ever, not one time, watched a full episode of the Wendy Williams show. I have watched clips and short snippets on social media that I have seen, or maybe I have watched like 10 minutes of it if she was saying something interesting, but I always turn the channel, I'm not even gonna lie. So I didn't really see what the fullness of her show is, but there, but I always, there were so many people who loved her being and they felt like she was rocking out and killing it. But one of the things that was really obvious to me was a lack of identity because she kept saying, I'm so bored, I'm so lonely, I can't wait to be on TV, and even making up stories in her head saying, oh, I'm gonna be on TV uh, this Wednesday, or I'm about to get my show again, or I'm about to be back on TV. And we all know that that was a lie. I don't know why Will and the publicist, Sean or Shauna, wanted her to be back on television or doing podcasts when they know she couldn't even keep her train of thought. It was like, it's all about the freaking money at this point. And to go back to my previous point, when you have done something for so long and a group of people, the world knows you as one thing, you start to lose your identity when you're no longer able to be the thing that everybody knows you for. So it's kind of like, who am I outside of being a TV host? And that's why I'm so adamant about getting back on TV and trying to get back on top because that's how everybody knows me. And that's a part of my identity that I have associated with the most. And that is taken away and that's stripped away from me. Who am I? Is the question. There's a full blown identity crisis happening at the root of all of these different medical issues, the divorce, mom passing away, the pandemic, 
dementia, alcohol, there is deeper issues that we absolutely have to explore. And there was even a scene where she was like, I don't need no therapist. I'm not going to no therapist, nothing. And I'm just like, no, you do. You need to go, boo. You need to deal with the deep issues, the core, the root cause, because all of these other things that we're seeing are just what we would call symptoms in the therapy world. So last but not least, as I give my final thoughts on this, we have to remember that Wendy Williams was the executive producer of this very documentary, Where Is Wendy Williams? That means she agreed to this, that she wanted to be a part of this, that she gave permission for this, all of those things happen when you are the executive producer. So this wasn't a show that was done on her by an outside company or production company without her permission. She gave permission for this. Now, I believe when she gave permission and wanted to do this project, they probably did it under the pretenses that it was going to skyrocket her career, that she was on the up and up, that she was going to come back and she wanted to share a little bit of her story. But unfortunately, it took a very hard turn and instead of it being a success story we've seen her decline and go downhill and because they're in contract because they're already in production because the cameras are already rolling and i'm sure that the checks have already been cut you can't just say oh forget this project no we can't air it on lifetime anymore no you have to follow through with it even if the documentary is taking a different turn so we seen it take a different turn and we really saw her decline on so many levels. And I believe that because the documentary was a few years in the making, it seems like I'm not sure that she was in the same state of mind at the end of this as she was in the beginning when she said yes to the project in general. Woo! There was so much more that I could have talked about out of this four hour, two part essentially documentary. But I just wanted to hone in on those few topics because if not, this video would have been a million years long. But thank you so much for staying to the end, for watching. Make sure you tap into some of my other videos on celebrity from a licensed therapist perspective. And I will see you next time. Be blessed.